I'm going to just jump into the word, okay? So this is uh, the title that the Lord gave me. I've been focusing on identity for the last few weeks when I've been preaching. And uh, it's about the prodigal son and Luke chapter 15, which is where 15, 20 comes from. But the Lord just said to me, it wasn't just the prodigal son that was searching for his father. It was every one of us that are searching for a father. So can we just bow our heads and pray for a minute and invite him to help us give revelation? So Lord, we're just grateful that your word is true and that you are the way to the Father. You said no man can get to the Father except through the Son. So we, we accept that, and we understand that you are the perfect model, and your Holy Spirit in us is what identifies who we are in you. Before anything else, we are sons and daughters of the living God, and you put your living spirit in us to awaken us and, and to bring revelation of how we apply the word of God in our lives. And we, we want to be good stewards, as we heard earlier, of every gift that you've placed inside of us. But more than that, Lord, you said that for this purpose, you came to destroy the works of the enemy. And just as the Father sent you, you send us into the world for that same that mission that you've given us to bring the kingdom to people who are lost and hurting. So we just ask you to bring that revelation into our hearts at a greater level today. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody said amen. So it's not just, you know, sons. It's also daughters, right? It was never meant to be, you know, just one of the genders. It's both. We are cre created in God's image, male and female. He created us. And um, won't even get off on that tangent, but it's so absurd that, that anybody would even challenge that. This gives you an idea of uh, what the culture is going through. So um, just a couple of text verses. So Luke 15, 20 is the one I quoted. It says, he arose. We know the prodigal son. He was in the pigsty, came to his father. But while he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Okay, so unlike the picture many of us have of God as an angry judge, who we try to avoid just in case he sees us. But if we could just hide from him, maybe he won't think about us because he wants to punish us. No. While he was still a far way off, the father saw him and didn't just wait for the son to come and grovel. The father ran to the son who was coming out of a mess to let him know, you're still my son. I still love you. Still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And in verse 22, it says, the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe, identifying him as a son. Put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this, my son was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Now, you know that this takes place in the context of a much bigger picture in this chapter of Luke 15. And what you might not have thought of before, and I'll ask you to stretch like I do often, is consider that Luke 16 might be connected to Luke 15 in more than just the next chapter. Say amen. amen. It'll go better for you. <laughs> and by the way, for fellowship, we're going to be upstairs in the upper room this Sunday. I, don't, I think I forgot to tell you that. But still come. We would still like you to connect with everybody here. So this is the verse in Luke 16. Uh, honestly, I've never heard a lot of people preach on this because it's a very confusing verse unless we see it in the context. It says, so the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly for the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon that, you will fa that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Do I have the wrong translation here or what? Like, why would God be saying when you fail, make, make friends with the unrighteous mammon so that when you fail, they may receive you? Well, I think we could clearly say that, it, that the master does not represent God, okay? Because thou shalt not steal, <laughs> right? That this man was being fired because he was stealing from his boss. So... Unfortunately, if we don't hear what it might mean, we just think, well, I, just, I guess I just don't know what that means. So that could be one of the ways we could look at this and, and just how the Lord has showed it to me over the years because it's you know, such a rich part of the Gospels, Luke chapter 15 and 16. So instead of just going through a lot of slides, I just, I, I just feel led to just read the verses. If you have your Bible, you can open up to Luke 15 and whatever your device or whatever, I'll read the verses and then I'll try to link in 
um, how, how this is laying out. So in Luke 15, chapter 1, I'm sorry, chap verse 1 in Luke 15 says, Then all the tax collectors and sinners, sorry, drew near to him to hear him. All right, so you could see that there's this group of people that were undesirables, deplorables, if you want to use a more modern term, in the eyes of the culture. Anybody here, were you a deplorable at one time in your life? We should all be raising our hands right now because we were separated from God by our sin. And then we worked hard enough to earn favor with God, didn't we? No, thank you. No, you can't do that. So you have to fall on the mercy of the Lord. And you have to say, Lord, forgive me, please. We heard that repentance and deliverance go hand in hand. So we, we, we needed to reach that point where we recognized we couldn't do it in our own strength. And we had to ask Lord, the Lord for mercy and to forgive us. And then most of us then made a decision to try as hard as we could to serve him for the rest of our lives and not to be compromised Christians. But what was it that drew them to him? I never lost that language. There was something about Jesus that people, even though they were in sin and he was holy, they were still drawn to him. And we should use that as a mirror for ourselves, our people being drawn to us. And, and there's another group of people here in verse 2. It says, the Pharisees and scribes, which is the other group, complain, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And, and this can happen to all of us. We can judge other people. We can think we're better than other people if we don't like the car they drive or the clothes they wear or they're not educated enough and we don't like the way they speak and, and we can think we're better than they are. And you need to know we're not. <laughs> but for the grace of God, that could be you. No matter who it is, could be Hitler you're looking at. If you think you couldn't have been Hitler, you got a problem. Because evil is in the heart of all people without the Lord. And it's, it's not a fun thing to think about this. And I don't mean to jolt you, but just to say that's part of the problem is we think we would never do those things. And you're better off living with the understanding that you don't know the dark side of who you are. And you need to stay in the light. And you need to cling to the light because he's the best example of how you should live. And as soon as we start watering down and think, well, we can just bring a little bit of manure into the fertilizer here. Sorry, no. Keep it pure. We're going to live our lives for you, Lord, 100%. So I guess looking at this picture on a surface level, you'd say, well, it's clear because they were drawn to Jesus, these tax collectors and sinners, that he loved them and he accepted them. Even though he didn't say what they were doing was okay, he was saying they were okay. But it doesn't say that they were drawn to the Pharisees and the scribes, does it? And why is that? Because... Their method was to shame people. And we're not drawn to shame unless it's really well hidden. Unless it looks like, I'm just trying to make you stronger. But you're not measuring up, so you got to try harder. And that might be true, but you'll get a lot further if you endorse people and you also compliment them on what they are doing right. I mean, not, not every person gets a straight A on everything that they do, but they can give the effort to try. God's not opposed to effort. It's just the earning piece. You can't earn your favor with God, but he wants you to get up and pray and, and worship and choose what you watch, all because we're in this mission to bring the kingdom to the world. These men that were scribes and Pharisees were supposed to be doing the Father's business. And they were misrepresenting the Father's love. So here they have Jesus right in front of them. And, and they see these sinners coming to him. And instead of being like, oh, I wonder if we should be learning something from that, they're complaining. And what does God think about complaining in the book of Exodus? Murmuring and complaining. He's not a big fan, is he? So which group does Jesus love? Yeah, I used to think it was just the tax collectors and sinners. And you know, Jesus said some pretty rough things to the Pharisees and scribes in the Bible. Brood of vipers. <laughs> Not exactly a compliment. But he loved them enough that he's considering them in this engagement that he's having right now. And, and we should look at life this way. Every day is different. Every situation is dynamically different. And yes, we want to live by the rules of the word of God. But how we apply the rules has to change with every situation. Because every person you look at is dynamically, miraculously complicated. And before you just launch with something, you better hear the Lord. 
How do you want me to speak to this person, Lord? How can I reflect your character? I want your nature in me to become so second nature that I don't even have to pause and think about how you would handle this situation. And to do that, I have to submerge myself in his presence, in worship, in the word of God. I have to cultivate a relationship with Holy Spirit and say, not my mouth, you speak through me. When I open my mouth, I want you to be the gate of what comes out and the way it comes out and the look in my face and the tone of my voice, all of it matters. And people pick up on inauthenticity, don't they? Also called phony. So it says, verse 3, he spoke this parable. That implies that even though there's multiple chapters in the parable, it's one parable. And, and there's a little bit of structure here. It says, what man of you, and he's speaking to his tax collectors and sinners, but the Pharisees can also hear him. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, doesn't leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds them? So there's a man with a hundred sheep. He loses one. He goes and he finds the lost sheep. Okay, I know this is not new to you. You've probably read this. What I hope is new is just the way we apply it. It says, when he found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep, which was lost, and the sheep is probably thinking, well, don't serve me for dinner, because then you just lost your sheep again. And then Jesus compares it to something else. He says, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 just persons who need no repentance. Now, who's, who's the object of that comment out of this picture here, right? It would be the scribes and the Pharisees, wouldn't it? Because Jesus is not just even hinting at it. He's saying, look, they're drawn to me. They're not drawn to you. But the mission that we're here for is to get them to understand a relationship with God is the best way to come out of your tax collector and sinner status. Another place in Scripture, he says that the harlots, the prostitutes, and the tax collectors are getting into the kingdom ahead of you. Scribes and Pharisees, the very thing you want is God amongst you is here, but you can't see it because you put everything in this box. You have a religious grid that you're looking through. Anybody here, could, could we be guilty of getting a religious grid? Please raise your hand or I'm not going to go on. Okay, thank you. Now that's called manipulation. We don't do that. <laughs> And then it says, or what woman, having ten coins, if she loses a coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? There you go. Ten coins, loses one, finds the lost coin. And when she's found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the piece which was lost. So there's a party again, right? Spend the coin that you found. <laughs> Likewise, I say to you, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is another shot at the Pharisees and the scribes who were upset that Jesus is speaking to the tax collectors and sinners. But say, wait a minute, these people are lost. And our job representing the Father's business, he could have said, right? Jesus could have said, you guys are here representing my Father's business, but you're misrepresenting my Father's business because you're shaming people. And you're, you're pulling rank on them. And you are acting like you think you're better than them. And that they're going to never measure up to you because most people couldn't even read and write. And these people spent nothing but their time just reading and writing and, and comment, commentating on things, right? And when they heard Jesus speak, they said, wow, he speaks as one who has authority. He's not quoting other people. He has authority. And so do we. And, and authentic Christianity leaks. People know it's in you, and they're drawn to it. And I'm not in no way trying to condemn anybody here. I'm, I'm actually saying that's the very thing Jesus said, but he brings out this next point. There's joy in heaven when some life gets turned around. Yes, and there's also joy in the earth. If you look in, in the book of Acts chapter 8, it says that Philip, who was not even one of the 12 disciples, went down into Samaria and started preaching there were miracle signs and wonders. There were demons coming out of people. What about us? Shouldn't that happen? It was the presence of, of the kingdom amongst the darkness. And it's an awesome verse that says there was great joy in the city of Samaria because people were getting demons cast out of them. And there will be great joy in Somerset County. With every demon that leaves, there's more joy. 
And we have the power that he gave us, not because of our greatness, but because we're willing to be that. He'll pour through the vessel his power. We stay out of the way. He pours through us. And, and it's really like Sylvie said, there's a profound thing that happens to you when you see someone get delivered because it's the same physical body, but it looks like a completely different person because they are. Because the animating spirit, the fuel that's running them is not that corrupted fuel anymore. It's the fuel of God. It's the spirit. That's why Jesus said, I'm not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. I am for this world. I was in the Garden of Eden before sin, and when I came back, I'm bringing that same presence that was in the Garden, and I'm giving every believer a deposit of that spirit if they want it. So we have the ability to let heaven meet earth through us. So there's, that's a pretty similar pattern. hundred sheep loses one, finds it, throws a party, and there's joy in heaven. Ten coins lose one find the coin, throw a party, and there's joy in heaven. And then it comes down, the funnel, in verse 11, and he says, there's a man with two sons. A certain man had two sons. So it goes from one out of 100 to one out of 10 to one out of two. And you might be thinking, why does this matter to us? Because we have to see ourselves in this story. Everything we read in scripture, we have to see ourselves in that story. And it's one of the hard parts of, of staying relevant as a church because culture keeps changing. And we have to apply the grid of scripture to the modern day understanding of how life should go. And I would tell you just completely uh, lie detector tests that there's no better plan for life than Jesus Christ. <laughs> right? No better plan. Let them all take their shot. He has proven himself over thousands of years that he's the way to go. And uh, I mean, you're in a church, so obviously I'm going to say that, but I'm not just saying it. I'm telling you, I, I have 100% conviction that he is the answer. Jesus is the answer for the world today. <laughs> Above him, there's no other, right? So father, the, the younger of the, of the two sons said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. Sorry, I keep throwing the wrong one here. My bad. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with, say it, prodigal living, if you're following along, right? We've been looking at that in our men's group, and if you're a man in this church, you can join our Thursday morning call at 7.30, and if you can't be there in person, you can join online. We highly encourage you to do that. And it was, well, is it a prodigal son or a prodigal father? Because prodigal... Prodigal could be generous. Prodigal could be risky, like he loves us so much, he'll come and find us in the pit. When he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land. This is uh, the prodigal son. And he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And this son would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself... You should have that highlighted in your Bible, I'll tell you what, because that's revelation. That's somebody just, you were walking in the darkness, and the Lord just throws a switch, and revelation comes on. And, and you couldn't have gotten saved if that didn't happen. Because the light had to go on, that, wait a minute, this is not my grandmother's religion. This is real. I can't believe it's real. I, I flushed religion down the toilet years ago, is what I said. I was out playing in bars and living the life, and... You know, the guy that people wanted to be like, they thought, no. Just, there's a scripture in Deuteronomy that says, God found Israel in the waste, howling wilderness. If you ever need a, a scripture to describe what it's like to be in sin and be far away from God, that's what it is. A waste, howling wilderness, that's where he was. And it says, when he came to himself, some versions, versions say, when he came to his senses, he realized, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to, and to spare? And I'm perishing with hunger. I'll arise and go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. That's a lie. But that's what he's thinking in that state of, of deteriorated condition that he was in. He wasn't integrated into his family, so he disintegrated. Yeah, that's what happens. When you're not connected with God, you disintegrate with God, and you integrate with sin, and you pick up a bunch of critters, spiritual critters. And 
Sylvie's husband, Bill, used to be a, a pest control guy, and his company was called Critter Gitter <laughs> down south. And he went, well, I went from pest control to deliverance. It's the same thing. We're still getting rid of critters, right? <laughs> now, this is beautiful. He arose and he came to his father. So it's a little different, right? Because the shepherd goes and finds the lost sheep. The lady that was sweeping goes and finds a lost coin. But this is the son coming back and finding the father. And that's why I said the Lord impressed on me that we're all children in search of our father. Not fathers. Because it would sound like you're making a grammatical error, right? We're all children in search of our fathers. No, father. Same father. God. That's the north star. That's what the compass points to. And no man gets to him except through the sun. Right? And that's the part I think that's confusing to people where they say, oh, well, you know, you're so narrow-minded. It's a father-son relationship that we're talking about. And if you want to get to the father, you come through the son. And we then represent the son. We're the body of Christ. Isn't that powerful? We're his hands and his feet. Anybody here feel up to that challenge? Like, really? In the natural, if it could be a little intimidating, right? Like, Jesus is my model. I'm going to fall short. And he said, no, I will be with you always. I'll be with you always. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I won't fear because I have a gun with me. No, because you are with me. That's why I'm not afraid, because you're with me. Mm. Big difference, isn't it? So the lost son, not the lost coin, not the lost sheep, the lost son finds the father. And that's the appeal today, isn't it? Is that each of us every day could make that prayer. Lord, help me understand the relationship with you as a loving father. Help me block out all the garbage, all the neglect. And if you grew up in a home where there was no father in the house, wow, how easy it would be to hold a grudge against the missing person. But God is saying, no, everything you need, I am. Fill in the blank. Everything you need. Do we often feel like we have what Danny Silk, I love him. He's a great minister. He says, we have a toolbox deficiency. We go into the toolbox and we say, Father, ah. thankfully, I'm not saying that personally as Peter. I had, a, I would say, a great father. He wasn't perfect, but they were both there. My mother and father were there every day. We ate our meals together. I knew how, how things were supposed to go in the house. Didn't always live up to that, but there was a path, right? And for people that don't have that. Now, let me just say, if, if you were the devil, <laughs> one of the greatest things you could do is destroy the nuclear family and remove the mother and the father from the house and tell people, you don't need a father. Two women are fine. Two men are fine. Just because it's been this way for thousands of years, no. The science has changed. Somebody got it. We don't believe that. Male and female, he made them. We're made in his image, male and female. You don't get to pick. A five-year-old kid at the Jersey Shore knows there's a difference between a boy and a girl. And that is not in any way to discount the fact that many people are confused about that. But that doesn't mean it has to be taught to five-year-old kids in our public school system, okay? Just saying. The lost son finds the father and throws a party. The same thing. First, this is all the same until we get here. We have a joyful dad, but we got an angry brother. <laughs> right? When they're talking about you lose a sheep, you go find it, yeah, everybody's happy. You lose a coin, you find it, everybody's happy. Lose a prodigal son, nobody's happy when he comes home because he didn't earn it. You never threw me a party. See what happens? You don't deserve it. I did. No, you didn't. Hello? Somebody. Did you deserve it? No, none of us deserved it. The Apostle Paul, I mean, he was really good at following the rules, right? And he said, I count that all as garbage. Everything I thought was going to help me find favor with God. No, what I want to do now is to know him and be found in him. You should memorize that in Philippians. But when the 
The son was still a great way off. The father saw him, had compassion, ran and kissed his neck. He said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Father said to his servants, bring out the best robe. You all knew that and be merry. Now the older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. Aren't you happy? Your brother's come. And because he's received, your father has received him safe and sound, the father has killed the fatted calf, but he was angry and would not go in. It's called, he's the victim. Temper tantrum. His father came out and pleaded with him, this older brother. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I've never transgressed your commandment. Wait a minute. If we get the magnifying glass out, there may have been a few times that you transgressed. Remember the rich young ruler? I've, I have followed all the Ten Commandments. <laughs> nah, you're just not looking hard enough. None of us. We all fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. There's sin in there. It came factory installed when you got born. And you can't save yourself. The blood of Jesus washes that away and makes us right in the Father's eyes. So... How come you never threw me a party? Never gave me a young goat that I may be married with my friends. But this son of yours, did he have a name? It's your brother, man. It's your brother. No, this son of yours has devoured your livelihood with harlots. You killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. Meaning that your brother spent his inheritance, but everything I have left is yours that's the way this works. So, if, I don't know, if maybe the older brother was thinking the brother was going to take something. And he says, look, it was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. So who's the angry brother in the opening scene in Luke 15? The Pharisees and the scribes. See the top line there? Who's the angry brother? Jesus is talking to these sinners. They're mad about it. They don't. They don't deserve to be in the kingdom. We earned it. Well, look, if you're earning something, you got the wrong formula. Trying to be like God is not to earn favor with God. It's to try to change the world. Because <laughs> the more you're like Jesus, the more the world's going to change around you. Because sin is so evident and rampant everywhere you look. It's never been darker in my lifetime. That if you just have honesty and, and patience with people in your kind, you stand out. And you... <laughs> Whatever, I, I don't get ahead of myself. Now, to end this, somebody said, okay, he's saying he's going to end it. There's just one more line here, but it's chapter 15, and I think it really is, is connected to what I said earlier. Luke 16, 1 says, he also said to his disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward. Okay, we alluded to this earlier. And I'm going to ask you to, to not think of the rich man as God for a minute and just think of it in the context of the parable because it's the next chapter but men decided where to draw the line on the chapter so it's possible that it could all still be part of the parable at least don't throw any tomatoes at me and call me a heretic and an accusation was brought to the to the rich man that this man was wasting his goods so do you know what a steward is you think of Joseph in the Bible, he was a steward over Potiphar's household. And it's a little unusual for somebody who was brought in as a slave to have the right to spend the money of the master. And you look closely, you go back to Genesis, it says Potiphar trusted him so much that he never even checked his checking account balance. That's a steward. That's trust. That's being faithful in a little thing for somebody else. And when you do that, God gives you more because he knows he could trust you. How are you going to get more when you can't even be faithful in another man's ministry? We're going to get there. That's what this says, right? So now we have this rich man, and it's called the unjust steward. And we do not want to be unjust stewards. This is a faithful issue. This is, this is where, we, where we set up every morning and we say, God, I'm going to probably fall short of my, of my ultimate goal of what I'm aiming at, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to keep on trying. I want to aim higher. I want to aim for Jesus. I want to be like you would be if you were here in my life. And he would be here in every one of our lives. 
He doesn't think less of you based on the occupation that you have. He would be the perfect plumber, the perfect policeman, the perfect housewife, whatever. Whatever role you're in, he wants to be there with you. And if you do it his way, it's going to end up way better. So he called him, the steward, and said, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship. Now, how many know we're going to have to do this? We're going to have to give an account of our stewardship. It says it right in the Bible. Uh, on, on Judgment Day, we're going to stand before the Lord and we're going to give an account. And that's not to be condemning in any way. Because David was a man after God's own heart. Was he perfect? No. But was he trying? Yes. So that's it. You have to live in this place where you're willing to repent and ask for forgiveness and say, Lord, your power in me is what's going to do it. Not my might, not my power, but your power working in me is going to help me reach this goal of transforming with ever-increasing glory into the image of your son. What a promise. Give an account of your stewardship. For you can no longer be steward. Then the steward said within himself, what shall I do? For my master has taken the stewardship away from me. I can't dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I've resolved what to do. And what does he resolve to do? Is this the Jesus way or the world's way? He, he decides to steal from the master in order to get in cahoots. Don't you love that word, cahoots? I don't know, man. Like he, he's betraying the master so that when he gets fired, he'll have good standing with this, these people. That's a sin. He's marking down the bills. So you don't break the law to find favor with God, do you? But this is a common thing the flesh wants you to do. Just take the shortcut. You can lie on your taxes. You took money under the table. You're, that's up to you. But, but you open the door for sin when you break the law. That's how it works. You don't, God's not cursing you. You're stepping out from the blessing. It gets real quiet when you say that. I resolve it to do that. When I'm put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, how much do you owe my master? A hundred measures of oil. Take your bill and write down 50. Then he said to the next one, how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said, write it down to 80. And this guy probably went, yeah, but he, had to get, he went down to 50. Why are you giving me 80? See, because it's never enough. You just got 20 off. Not enough. So the master commended the unjust steward. Now, this is where it gets confusing, because we think if that's God saying, oh, yeah, you were really, you, you deceived him really well, that master. No, it can't be God. It's, I'm going to tell you, it's back to that top line up here. It's the Pharisees and the scribes that instead of giving people the truth, they were watering down the truth and saying, yeah, I know what it says, but... You know, if you're attracted to another person of the same sex, I'm supposed to treat you with love the way you want to be treated. And if that's love to you, then I'm going to say that's okay. No, sorry. And, and I know how painful that is to have to say to people. But what if you weren't just attracted to the same sex? What if it was your sibling? Would it be okay to, to, to engage in incest? So... Everybody's drawing the line somewhere. Would you have sex with an infant? But I have a desire for that. Well, I have to treat you the way you want to be treated. If that's what you like, then yeah, sure. Because it's all just a social construction anyway. There's really no absolute truth. This is what the world believes. And it's not the way it's spoken about in the gospel. We surrender to your will, Lord. We surrender. We may not fully understand all the ways you're asking us to live, but you saved my life out of a pit. Hell lost another one. <laughs> Definitely true. So even if I don't fully understand everything you're asking me to do, I'm going to get myself around other people who are mature Christians, and I'm going to ask them to help me understand what you're asking me to do. And I'm going to ask them to pray with me when I'm having a hard time resisting that temptation that's coming. Because what I don't want to do is be a decaf Christian. And if people in the pulpit are watering down the word, there's no power to wake you up. <laughs> decaf doesn't wake you up. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. And got any sons of light in here? This is where I think you can close it out and say, I say to you, make friends of your unrighteous mammon. When you fail, they will receive you. He's faithful in least, is faithful also in much, and he's unjust in what is least, is unjust also in much. But here's where it comes home. 
If you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you haven't been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon. Verse 14 says, now the Pharisees who were lovers of money. Oh my God. What's the greatest commandment, Jesus? Thou shalt love the dollar bill with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. So if they're lovers of money, they're bankrupt in their job description because they're telling everybody else, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So that's, that's why I'm saying it makes me think that because he loves them, he's letting them know that decaf is not going to work. You can't water it down. You can't mark down the bill. People want to be told that there's a standard to live by. And if you keep watering it down, they don't know what to do. But what, you know, so again, Danny Silk was in a, in a family with a broken home, uh, multiple relationships that he witnessed his mom got divorced, got remarried, got divorced, abusive men. He said when he went to do his master's degree, he had to write his family history. He lost count at 30 men that had lived in his house during his childhood, right? So he had a toolbox deficiency. He didn't know what it, what it was like to be in relationship with a man, but he kept a father figure, but he came into the church at Bethel, Bill Johnson's church out in California, and he said, I read the word, I heard it, but I also witnessed it in the people that were around me, the elders of the church, people that were married 30, 40 years. He said, I didn't know anybody my whole life that was married more than 15 years. Everybody he knew got divorced. So you see the standard might look hard, but you don't water down the standard in order to get people to like the message. We all want the truth. We're burning inside to know the real deal. And we, we, we have a detector for phoniness. We have a detector if people are saying it. If, if their walk is not matching their talk, stock price goes down. But when you take a stand for courage, remember Mario Murillo? Think he's real worried about what people think? Or is he worried about telling the truth? Are people getting healed? Or are they getting set free? Yes, because even though it can be hard to hear that you have to make some changes, they're for the better, aren't they, church? So we can't be lovers of money. And then we can either be an orphan or we can be a child of God. So let's stand because this is where I think if we're all honest, we have a little bit of Cain and a little bit of Abel, right? Cain killed Abel. Abel was the righteous one. Cain was a murderer. But in our own personalities, we can go good or bad. We can, we can drift towards God or we can drift away from God. So there's not like one answer here that if you just... Buy my book and follow my 10 steps, you're going to be okay. It's, no, you, like, uh, I love what Pascal Urabaza said, spend less time on Facebook and get your face in this book. <laughs> That's a keeper. <laughs> and if you realize that we're bound to be that religious hypocrite in our own, you keep throwing yourself on the mercy of God every day and saying, Lord, I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to be an accurate reflection of you, even when it's hard, even when it's difficult. And I have to tell people why I believe what I believe and they don't agree with me. All right. So can we just lift our hands for a minute and just say, Lord, fill me with your power, the purity of your word and the revelation of your spirit that, that every situation I'm in. I will first seek your will and not my carnal nature. I want your will to be second nature in my life, that I would submerge myself into your ways and into your word and into your spirit, and that I would cancel every curse that's been spoken over my life. That was a lie about my identity. I see myself by faith as a child of the living God who loves me with open arms is waiting for me to receive your embrace. Help me, Lord, to cast off the besetting sins that are slowing me down in my race for you. That's right out of the book of Hebrews. Maybe you know that. 
comparing it to running a race. And sin is a weight on you that slows you down. And when you cast off that sin, you're able to run faster. All right? That's our hope, church. That's our hope. Not that we learn the rules better, but that we become more like Jesus. And everybody here is, is a child searching for their father, our father, our corporate father. So that's the last thing I'm just going to... I'm just going to pray is that you would just say it with me. Heavenly Father, I want to change my mindset about who you are and any counterfeit picture. I just ask you to purge it from me. Detox the world's picture of who you are that I might see the authentic version of that pure love for me. In Jesus' name. Amen. And we talk about getting born again. That's like getting a, a new birth certificate. So if you don't know the Lord, you can be born again right now. And it would be March 13th, 2022 would be your new birthday, your spiritual birthday. Mom was January 1st, 1983, with a hangover, by the way, because the night before was uh, New Year's Eve, right? And that's when I came to my senses from the pigsty. But if you're here today and you don't know the Lord, you should come up to the altar right now. Right, church? Shouldn't they? Wouldn't it be the best decision they would ever make? Because every one of us here that's a Christian had to say, I'm sorry, Lord, I repent. I didn't know the truth, but now I do. And instead of running away from you, I'm going to run towards you. So that invitation is open. If that's anybody here or anybody online, please understand, he loves us all. Be a child, not an orphan. Love you all. Appreciate you. The prayer team's here. Join us for fellowship. That's in the upper room upstairs at the Commons building. And we'll see you soon.